Human beings have dreams. Even dogs have dreams, but not you. You are just a machine, an imitation of life. Can a robot write a symphony? Can a robot turn a canvas into a beautiful masterpiece? Can you? That's a clip from the movie I, Robot. It covers territory that's pretty well worn at this point. Will consciousness rise up in the robots and take over the world? But I think there's a deeper and more relevant and certainly more immediate question that comes to mind with what it means to being human. And it's explored quite beautifully by today's guest, Connor Habib. I now use the question rather than what is consciousness or all, that that is important to me, but I think what is the human being is my question that I try to unfurl everything from. I, I can't just do this bullshit thing, which people do all the time, which I find completely objectionable, which is, well, you just take the good and you leave the bad, just move on with the good stuff because that doesn't address the foundational thing that you bring up all the time. What I need to do is find out how the good and the bad are entangled and liberate that philosophy from itself. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and today we welcome Connor Habib back to Skeptico. Connor is the creator and host of Against Everyone with Connor Habib a fantastically named interview podcast video series that explores sexuality, spirituality, science, oh, and just a whole bunch of other stuff that is always interesting, especially when Connor does it. He has a new book in the works, or it might even be out. We'll have to hear about that. It's titled Hawk Mountain. And he recently pinged me about why evil matters. So we're going to have to see why he wanted to Poke the bear there. <laughs> Connor, welcome back to Skeptico. Thanks so much for joining me. Hey, Alex. It's really nice to talk with you again. Hi. <laughs> so what is going on? What's going on with Against Everyone? And what's going on with the new book? And what's going on in Ireland? Yeah. So um, I did, since we last talked, um, Against Everyone is pr pretty much taken off. It's, gone, it's going really great. Um, and... Uh, I've just sort of been getting deeper and deeper into the conversations and letting myself go a little bit more because the whole point was I wanted big talk, not small talk. And so just letting myself get deeper into topics with thinkers who I respect and um, kind of abandoning also I'm moving away from LA. I moved out of that sort of current of you always have to be visible and successful. Like I kind of moved out of that when I moved to Ireland. I was like, I'm just going to do what I care about. And then surprise, surprise, of course, the show blows up after that, right? So <laughs> there's that. Um, the, the, the novel I wrote, which is called Hawk Mountain, um, doesn't come out till next year, but I did sell it, which is great. It's a very dark very dark book <laughs> about um repression and and love and uh and and murder so it's a bit of a crime book um and i'm very excited for that i've always wanted to be a novelist my whole life so that was like one of the unrealized dreams and now that's coming out next year and ireland's great <laughs> yeah, the last time we were i was on your show we i was just about to move here um and uh now i'm here and it feels exactly right so yeah perfect great to hear and i just popped up for people who are watching the youtube and we're just talk, chatting about you know this has always been a podcast skeptico and it still is primarily a podcast that's how it reaches people but i have this really cool new tool called descript and i was just saying how it allows me to kind of crank out the video at the same time so i was pulling up the video if you ever want to watch that on youtube of your excellent show against everyone and i've listened to a bunch of episodes i've made notes on some of the ones that you sent me that you thought would be particularly relevant to what we might talk about today but even that might be outdated as this conversation flows and goes on. But I really do like the way that you're diving deeper and deeper into these topics, even though I disagree with you about 90% of the time. I love the, I love we'll the intellectual rigor and the depth that you bring to this, which Thanks. is really what these conversations should be about. So let's see where would you like to start before i give you the whole skeptico drill um 
Yeah. I mean, I think something that I hear on your show all the time um, that I think I would like to start with is something that we do agree on. And I want to disagree that we don't agree on 90%, but let's see, Um, (laughs) is, uh, you know, the idea that reality claims are first and foremost, it's something that I'm, I'm coming up against in, in uh, my academic work a lot. Like I'm reading these anthropology books where someone will say, you know, I met this indigenous person and he told me that a wolf threw up foam on him and gave him the cure for smallpox. And then they'll say, so what does it tell us about the kinship structure? And I'm like, what the fuck? What, what do you mean kinship structure? <laughs> like, why, why are we not talking about the vomiting talking wolf? Like, that's very important, you know? So I've been seeing how that sort of rife through everything in a real firsthand way that in a place where it's supposed to be more understood, more accepted in anthropology. Now, in fairness, in academia, I think anthropologists have gone the farthest or the furthest in um, in investigating reality claims, ontologies, metaphysics, that kind of stuff, and really actually trying to understand, but not, I mean, it's still not enough as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah. So I just want to start, I think maybe there, like the, the, the importance of the reality claims and. um, Well, you know, uh, that is an excellent point to start on and agree. uh, Totally. We are in sync about that. And, you know, you've kind of heard me go on and on about, that in terms of the book Why Evil Matters and the claims of Scientology founder L. Ron Hubbard, and who is in the desert and is summoning the Antichrist doing this ritual in order to bring forth the Antichrist and the horror of Babylon and all that <laughs> stuff. And then the scholar that I've had, and I'm not even going to mention his name because this poor guy <laughs> is just good. No, you know, what? I, I'll mention his name because I really like Hugh. Hugh Urban wrote a great book called um, Mag- Magia Sexualis about how um, magic and sexual liberation are tied into certain left wing causes and social and cultural change. And that's a really great book. But I think you're right to to make a point out of that mistake of his, which is to be like, well, it matters that they believed in it. It's not, that does matter, but that's not all that matters. And to stop there is to- Well, it's, it's not even to, yeah. to stop there, it's to start there. Is, right, right, right. <laughs> you know, I mean, because the starting point needs to be And, you know, it's tough because we can immediately go to inside baseball and we just might as well go there since that's where we're going to go anyway. (laughs) Because, you know, the flip side of the reality claim thing is that we really don't have a handle on what reality is to begin with. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like it's like this kind of paradoxical, well, aren't they right in a way that it only matters what you believe since there isn't any grounding in reality anyway. And the problem with that, of course, is the same problem that uh, we have with atheism is that, no, if you don't get the first question right, if you don't Mm -hmm. understand the nature of consciousness and that you're not wrestling with whether consciousness is real or an illusion, well, then you can't move on to the second part of the question and say, well, you know, none of it is is real because we don't really have a handle on whether we're we're in a simulation or whether uh, reality is what we think it is in certain terms of our five senses or any of the rest of it or extended reality is interfering in their spirit world. All those things could come into play but we shouldn't give those guys a pass and let them at the table as if they've passed the Mm -hmm. preliminary exam because they haven't. So Mm -hmm. Hugh Urban probably has because he's, like you said, he's exploring sex magic and he's looking at tantric cultures in India and all the rest of that. But when he makes the conscious decision to leave that behind and play the game of materialistic, atheistic, religious studies where consciousness is an illusion, then he's, I think he's given up his right to engage in that dialogue in a real way. He has to pick and he's in a forced choice kind of position because he can't hold his job. He can't publish. He can't be, Mm -hmm. continue to pick up his paycheck if he abandons the, the, the dogma, but at the same time, he can't really engage in this conversation with you and I, if he is, if he doesn't go there, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, I think that's great. I mean, I think you're, I, I think a way to say it is, you know, um, 
if you don't have, if you don't pick the right question, you know, like all the answers to the questions that you pose will be skewed. That doesn't mean valueless. It just means like you're going to further obfuscate as you go on. For me, I, I, I now use the question rather than what is consciousness or all, that, that is important to me. But I think what is the human being is my question that I try to unfurl everything from. That's, I think, a fundamental question. Um, there aren't very many fundamental questions that are close to what is the nature of consciousness. But I think that that one's close and that's close or it has a parallel course to it. Um, and I think, you okay, know, so can I pause? Can I yeah. have you pause there and tell us more about what you mean, what that means to you, particularly in the topic areas that people are going to most be associated with your work in terms of social uh, sexuality, uh, mm. social justice issues and those kind of things, because there's an unwrapping that I want to do there, but I'm intrigued by where you're going <laughs> with that, because I think that is maybe you're going to leapfrog me and, and I want to be ready for that. That's a very <laughs> question that you pose. What is a human being? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, the, why I would ask that is because it, it just, I would say if nothing else, it's, it's not nothing else, but if nothing else, it brings a sense of warmth to the question of consciousness. We can ask very cold dissective questions about consciousness, but seeing what is the human being begins to include, I think, for me, questions about love, questions about feeling, about relating, about connectivity, about that kind of stuff in a way that I feel sometimes that even people who are doing this really great work about consciousness can tend to leave things a little bit cold. And then I think, well, that's not including everything that we need to include here because there are states of consciousness that lend themselves to warmth, um, states of consciousness that lead themselves to sense of separation, to incompleteness, to intensities, all that kind of stuff to, 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 to love, to desire. And so I think asking this question, what is the human being brings in and invites in that um, angle of it, which I think is very important. And I'm not saying, you know, maybe it's just a semantic issue or you would identify it as such, but I just, I, I think you would know what I mean when I say some people doing consciousness exploration are also very cold and clinical in a way that excludes a whole aspect of being human, which I object to. Oh, I think that's, I think that's quite brilliant. And I think that's also part of the, I mean, everything has the potential to be co-opted. And I would suggest that you really put your finger on a way that consciousness is and certainly will be co-opted. And that is in this kind of scientific, technocratic, what, what is the quantum level understanding of consciousness? And that needs to be the base of our understanding of it, as if we would even understand what quantum level stuff is. I think your warmth thing is beautiful. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, the backdoor materialism happens everywhere. And it's just like, it's infuriating when you spot it in people that are otherwise doing good work, because you're like, oh, come on, like, <laughs> like, you're going down the right path, but there's a gravity, because materialism is dense. Um, there's a gravity to it, and that pulls you back into it. Or, or maybe it's like you have to constantly uh, you have to constantly surface from materialism, like a seal coming through like a, a hole in the ice, you know, for like to see the rest of the world. So I think you're right. And um, yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Good. We're off to a nice start so far. <laughs> We're off to a nice start. So let's crash it into the rock. <laughs> let's do it. So, you know, related to this, I think is the issue of who is doing that social engineering that we're talking about. Because I think mm. we can easily kind of blow past that, right? And say, they're co-opting. And then we never stop and say, okay, well, who is <laughs> co-opting? Yeah. Co or we're saying, oh, poor Hugh Urban, he can't keep his job and he can't publish if he doesn't toe the party line. Who is maintaining the party mm. line? What are, how, how, who is imposing the sanctions on that kind of talk? And then I would switch over to kind of the, the topic in the subject area where you've kind of made a, lot of, uh, made a lot of noise and a lot of positive noise and raised a lot of 
consciousness about issues that are real and are troubling to people who do care about true social justice. And I'm talking about sexuality and LGB, T, Q, and now they have like- Get the whole alphabet in there, Alex. Whole <laughs> and, and we joke, we joke about that, but there, there's a realness to that. There's real social issues there. But the part that I wanted to explore is, it's also clearly, in my opinion, it's a psyop, right? It's partially a, a, a psyop. And do we have to care? Do we have to deconstruct to the extent to which we're now being- push towards a transgender agenda that may have some real issues in it, but also seems to have issues that resonate with a very weird AI techno uh, yeah. Orwellian craziness. Tell you what, to cap off that little uh, intro there, I, I recently did an, uh, an interview with uh, David Icke, who I think is just you know David Icke? Yeah, yeah, of course. But David Icke, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Lizard people. Exactly. Love it. Love it. <laughs> the lizard guy, right? The reptilian yeah. guy, right? Which is a, a, a wonderful way that we uh, pigeonhole people. We uh, limit people's uh, ability to speak. Although now they've gone the next level with David, of course. And he's been uh, uh, banned from YouTube and mm -hmm. from uh, Facebook which we now are comfortable with the idea that people can be banned. You know, David is an advocate of very much a nonviolence guy advocate of kind of love your enemy. Don't engage at the same energetic level of the people who are about hate. And he's been like that for the longest time. This is of course a voice that we don't want to hear. Right. And it's also, he, the, the, the whole idea, I think it, it's interesting just for us to all look in the mirror and say, five years ago even, certainly 10 years ago, but even five years ago, if someone told you that we would ban people from one of the primary communication platforms, larger than any of the television network platforms, that people would be banned for advocating free speech, free thought, and open thinking, we would have thought that was impossible. And now we accept it in the same way we, as we just put on that mask to go outside. So here's David Icke. I think it touches on a lot of things we're talking about. And I think it'll maybe springboard us into a discussion about evil. Consciousness. You know you are an infinite expression of consciousness. And that will never allow itself to be subjugated and uh, intimidated into submission by, um, by the said psychopaths and, uh, and idiots. If you can isolate five sense mind in, in this symbolic bubble, and then within the bubble, feed that isolated uh, mind a sense of reality by controlling the education system all the way through the formative years, by controlling the, um, the mainstream media, the Silicon Valley media, and, and so on then you can, um, first of all, isolate mind from expanded consciousness, and then you can program that isolated mind with a sense of reality, which is all about little me. It's all about self-identification with labels, what I call I am our. I am our man, I am our woman, I am our black, I am our white, I am, I am this sexuality, I am our that sexuality. Okay, well, something there, and I'll edit that down a little bit, but I want you to get the full flavor of uh, Lizard Guy. I, he's just a lizard <laughs> guy, talks about aliens and reptilians. Mm. He didn't mention it in that clip, but that's who he is. He's the reptilian guy. So what did you think? Anything popped to mind there? Yeah, okay, so a few things. So first I want to say about David, I, I don't know that much about him other than my general impression, and I watched that documentary about him, which I thought was – which he made with his family, I think, and was, a, I'm gonna get to the clip in a second, but which I thought was actually a tremendous disappointment and disservice because he self-censored. Like there was nothing about lizard people in that documentary and I thought was the lizard people thing. I know that that's real. So why wasn't there any of this? And it was all about consciousness, this consciousness, that in a way that I actually thought with due respect to him, even though I don't know if he deserves it because I don't really know him that well, um, 
that that uh, I thought was rather actually basic. I think that those kinds of thoughts about consciousness, yeah, sure, they're interesting. I mean, they're they're the things that pop out about Silicon Valley and um, how we deal with identities and all that. But I don't find anything that like, wow, we need to like turn to David Icke for answers here. <laughs> it seems actually rather simplistic. For me, I am definitely interested in how identities become. Um, I, I said years ago that I thought that they were becoming new nationalisms, that as our um, faith um, and relationship to the state started to erode, we started building what we consider to be new states, and those are our identities, and we can tell that we treat them like states because when someone gets the language wrong, we banish them and we exile them from the state if they don't say the right you know, words. Now, I also think we're getting something from it. It's informing us, it's educating us, all that kind of stuff. I don't want to just say, oh, it's purely bad. I think we get something from it. But then I've also, you know, recently on my show talked to political philosopher Michael Hart, and, you know, he and his writing partner, Antonio Negri, designate these identities as uh, instances of extensions of private property. And I find that very interesting, too. And those things do overlap with some of what David's saying in that clip, which I find, you know, that's, that's provocative, that um, actually we're being told to sort of densify our sense of I am this, I am that, but in terms of property, in terms of nationalism, and in ways that create walls between us that become almost uh, or seemingly insurmountable. And in fact, very many of the same people who say that they are against walls, against <laughs> borders and all that kind of stuff, are creating infinitely dense borders by turning aspects of their uh, consciousness into bound up, walled, you know, communities. So I would agree with him there. Um, but I did think I needed to add that caveat because um, I get a little frustrated uh, turning to him in, in the sense that there are lots of people working on this problem in very interesting and I think more complicated ways. So I listened to a bunch of those shows that you sent me and I, I don't see where we're really getting at some of the issues that, we're, that you're talking about in this deeper way. Because I think fundamental to what Ike is saying there, what, what I want you to respond to is okay. that fundamentally, no, well, no, it's okay. Cause I like everything that you said. I, I love. <laughs> no, no, everyone. I said, okay. Cause I'm I want to hear you. You're against <laughs> me, man. We're cool with that. <laughs> no, this I just want to hear. Go. Okay. Like what, what was it? Okay. What you do you have? Me? Okay. What do you yeah, have? Yeah. Bring it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm sorry, Connor. I don't want it, but <laughs> I, I, I really appreciate, and, and I want people to know this, I really appreciate the, the level of, and from the beginning, you know, we've known each other for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And you reached out to me years ago, and I was like, oh, this guy's brilliant. This guy's <laughs> brilliant. You know, he's on all this stuff. And then the last time we talked, and, uh, uh, oh, you know, you've always had the Rudolf Steiner stuff, which I never quite understood and unpacked. Mm. And I still remember the quote. I use it all the time. You know, and the quote about uh, about Rudolf Steiner, Steiner and evil. And you're kind of, we were having this conversation I love where we kind of get frustrated with each other. And you reach a point, you go, look, here's what Steiner said. You can be the biggest creep in the world, the biggest evildoer in the world. And then you die and you have to deal with the consequences of that. And then you come back and you can do it again and again and again. And Steiner says, Here's the, the ultimate consequence. If you do it 13 times in a row, then your soul is destroyed. And I, think that's, I think that's kind of absurd in a way. And it's a strange sure. kind of backdoor materialism in a, in a kind of way. But at the same time, it, it gets at something that is probably a core truth that I think you were pointing to. And that's that let's not get too hung up on the evil that you may be subjecting your soul to because you will deal with the consequences of that. Mm, and mm. you will leave the, the havoc behind with the other people that you encounter. And that's a horrible thing. And you should definitely try and avoid doing that. But from a societal cultural level, let's not get too worked up about that. That has to do with you and your life review, buddy. And if you can handle the karma, have at it. So I think where I appreciate what Ike is saying and I think that it, it, it really is deep in its simplicity in a way that I, I don't think you really responded to. So I'd go back to your comment. Mm -hmm. I'd wind it all the way back to the beginning. And I'd say, you know, in his, uh, in his 
movie or whatever, and I haven't seen the movie you're referring to. He doesn't talk about lizard people, you know. He didn't talk about lizard people with me either, because we got a, we had a million other things to kind of uh, talk about. But I would say that that is also an unfair criticism of anyone who's been in the public arena, you know, and has talked about a lot of things. I mean, if every time you came on a show, you had to talk about porn, you know, I mean, you, you're, you could be comfortable doing that because you've covered that topic. But after a while, you'd be kind of like, I don't need right. to cover sure. that territory every time. You know, I think about a lot of different things and I've investigated a lot of different things. And, you know, for you to kind of pigeonhole it is part of the process too. But that's kind of an aside, but that addresses that first point. But the second point that I think is really central to this that I wanted you to respond to is that a lot of these social issues that you seem to care about and you seem to put a lot of energy into, to me, they face the same dilemma that we're facing with the Hugh Urban dilemma. Mm -hmm. And that is we have to get to the bottom mm -hmm. of whether or not there is an element of social engineering control behind it. So is the transgender movement, transgender rights in particular, that's one that particularly jumps out to me as being kind of a carrier virus for a larger agenda that we seem to be, that seems to be cropping up again and again. So I think it's totally fine for someone to go, that is absurdly crazy conspiracy nonsense. That's an appropriate response to that. But the, the, the counter to that would be to say, is there any element of truth to it? And if there is, then how would that change how we think about that as a social issue? Right. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, I have plenty to say on that. Um, so I don't, so I've had trans and non-binary people on my show um, who I love. <laughs> I don't think that... Um, I don't think that it is a particular, particularly or singled out or singular issue as far as any kind of op or social control goes, right? I think that there are... Not a singular, just, just to keep it on track, not a singular okay. issue. No, not at all. doesn't happen. Okay, okay. So, so but, but I think that that's important, right? I think you're right all social issues in some way are part of some op and part of social control, 100%. I mean, this is something that you, and now I am gonna talk about porn, but it's something that you learn when you do sex work right away because you have people attacking you instantly and saying, well, yeah, you said you consent to that, but actually you're just part of the patriarchy and you've been brainwashed. And then you have to be like, how do you know you haven't been brainwashed? And so you have a lot of people sort of pointing fingers at each other being like, no, you're the one in the social control. You're the one in the social control. But the fact is we all are to varying degrees and we're all experiencing that. And that unfurls into our causes. So you're absolutely right to identify the fact that when we start at any level beyond what I think the fundamental question is, which is what is the human being? The unfurling of the issues becomes completely distorted in a way that makes it more susceptible to social control, that can sometimes even turn it into social engineering and social control, that can um, rip it away from its sort of earlier, warmer, uh, you know, per, I don't know, but, you know, person, human being based context, um, its consciousness context, and, and distort it and make it terrible. So I think you're absolutely right. Um, I just am, I'm just pushing back on the trans thing because I don't think that that's uh, any different than any other issue. Let's say it's not different than any other issue. I do, I wanna push a little bit further on this because I think you're kind of pulling up right at the point where it becomes interesting. It's kind of okay. like the Hugh Urban thing. Well, it, 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 yeah, it doesn't matter. It only matters what people believe. Well, it only matters that yes, it could be a, an element of social control. Don't we have to do a full stop don't we have to do a reboot? Don't we have to completely deconstruct and re-examine everything mm. we thought we knew? I think we do. Let me play a little mm. clip, clip again, because I think the, the feminism movement, and I just had an interview with it yesterday with this wonderful, wonderful person, <laughs> Dr. Gail Kimball, and she, was, she actually founded the Women's Studies Program at uh, Cal State Chico. And uh, Professor Emeriti written some fantastic books. But, you know, I was hitting her up about the Gloria Steinem thing. 
I call Gloria yeah. Steinem, <laughs> outed as a lifetime CIA player. And right. what she said that I think relates to this interview we're having here, she says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me because she did a lot of good. And that's what I hear so many people who are interested in social <laughs> issues talk about. It doesn't matter. And, and stop right there. I think it may not matter. I think that's a potentially valid point. It may right. not matter, but it may matter. I, I agree may, with, I, yeah, I agree with I'll, you. Let me play matters. this clip and then see. Okay, what you okay, think. okay, yeah. Well, one of the things they told me was that um, he well, we were, was at the house one night and uh, we, were talk, we were talking and he started laughing. He said, Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about? And uh, I said, I, I had pretty conventional thinking about it at that point. I said, I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote, you know? And he started to laugh. He said, you're an idiot. And I said, why am I an idiot? He said, you want, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded women's lib, you know? And we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television, the Rockefeller Foundation. He says, and you want to know why? He says, there were two primary reasons. And they were, one reason was we couldn't tax half the population before women's lib. And the second reason was now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. So it breaks up their family. The, the, the kids start looking at the state as the family, as the school, as the officials, as their family, not as the parents teaching them. And so those are the two prim primary reasons for women's lib, which, which I thought up to that point was a noble thing. You know, when I saw their intentions behind it, where they were coming from when they created it, the thought of it, I saw, I saw the evil behind what I thought was a noble adventure. Um, so lots of things to pull apart there. So one, it does absolutely matter that Gloria Steinem worked for the CIA because what we see there is a complete compromise in the ethical and moral framework in which she presented as having. So we understand that she's a liar and a phony um, and that she's just a posturing figurehead. So we will get back to something deeper than that, but that on its own should matter to us, right? So even if you wanna not accept any idea that the women's liberation movement was created by the Rockefellers or whatever, that should matter to people. But the other thing I wanna say is, here's where we run into some, some uh, complication. You know, my friend Mona al Tawi, you know, she writes a lot about female genital mutilation um, in, uh, well, in many, in many different countries, including the US. And it happens to young girls and it, it is, I mean, truly horrific, right? And part of the resistance to uh, the, in what I think is rightly called uh, ritual abuse of young girls, um, part of the opposition to that comes from the sort of knock-on effect from this, you know, women's liberation movement, which I think in, in some ways was as your guest points out, funded and run by uh, institutions of power. In other ways, not so much because there are lots of women liberation, women's liberation movements that predate that one, that have their roots in spiritual you know, practice, that have their roots in other kinds of you know, uh, traditions. You know, the, the spiritualist movement, for instance, was a great you know, uh, entanglement with uh, female sexual and political liberation in the 19th century. So there are all these other sort of precursors. And then there are also these knock-on effects where uh, a lot of people in certain countries feel empowered to fight against FGM, to fight against their husbands literally owning them because of certain feminist texts that they've gotten. So I do think on the one hand, it matters. And on the other hand, it doesn't matter. So we have a much more complicated picture than being able to say one or the other. Um, or, well, you know what? Actually, I'm going to roll that back. It always matters. It always matters. But that doesn't mean that we can't still say complicated things about the good that came out of it. So I guess I would actually revise my statement. Um, but how it matters to us and the kinds of, because what I worry about, Alex, and I think you've seen this before, is that people will hear something like that interview and be like, well, it was all just a great conspiracy. I mean, women's liberation, it's just, you know, Rockefeller, you know, whatever, planned op. And it's like, well, okay, but 
that's not giving us a fuller picture. And by the way, I don't know about that information quite so much. I know about the Gloria Steinem CIA connection and some of the other feminists who, uh, you know, tried to, you know, incite war and support uh, the Israeli government and all that kind of stuff. But I don't know, and certainly all the anti-sex work worker feminists, um, but I don't exactly know about that exact thing that Aaron Russo is talking about. Aaron Russo, was that his name? Yeah. Yeah. So, you bring up a, yeah, a number of interesting points and there is no substitute for deep thinking. <laughs> <laughs> and again, that's what I love about what you do with your guests and people can see that from this interview is you have the ability to kind of probe all the different sides of the issue. And I don't, I, I don't apologize for kind of pushing you because that's it's where fine. this stuff gets interesting. And I think it's also where where we have to go, because if you are so easily manipulated by this, it's like the trigger uh, uh, alert or a trigger warning. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I love Gordon, Gordon White, who who's, I was on Rune Soup, and that's what originally brought you back to me. But it's like, ugh, he just frustrates me to no end. Like at the beginning <laughs> of our interview, he does this trigger warning. Oh, this is a trigger warning. We might say some things mm -hmm. that might trigger you. How fucking condescending can you be? You know what? <laughs> if I trigger you, then, I, you know, then that is on you. Mm -hmm. That is on you to investigate why you're being triggered. I am triggered all the time by mm -hmm. so many things. It is my spiritual path to become less triggered, to figure out why I'm triggered and to reintegrate my triggering but not to, not to, you know, create, a, a further perpetuate this big daddy is here to protect you kind of thing. <laughs> even if it's in a podcast form that I have to warn you that you might be triggered. Don't yeah. be triggered. There you right. go. Don't be triggered. Don't allow it to happen. So, and then I want to kind of add that back into the discussion we're having because you're so right about the knock-on effects, but I would suggest that that is really the power of the co-op. If you co-op a non-issue, mm -hmm. then you have no power. Mm -hmm. If you co-op a real injustice, then it has power. Mm -hmm. My mother, I'm old enough that I can tell you my mother was completely oppressed. She wasn't particularly a good person, had a problem with drug and alcohol abuse, but still, I can have tremendous empathy for the fact that she had zero opportunity other than to get married. She had uh, zero opportunity to express herself as an artist without being labeled and all the rest of these things. Those were the very rigid structural elements of our society that she lived in. So for her, uh, women's liberation was a real thing. And I mm -hmm. get where someone would say, I don't care because they look at how they've been oppressed and how their group has been oppressed. And they say, I don't understand how the whole thing works, but I understand we're on the long, we're on the short end of the stick here and we need to change that. I certainly understand that. I don't know what your background was like, but growing up gay, Arab <laughs> in the Midwest, right? Wasn't it? Pennsylvania, uh, bad enough. Pennsylvania. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, man. Not so easy. Not so great. <laughs> you were battling against the social constructs, social prejudices that shouldn't be there. They're not mm -hmm. a good thing. So I, I can totally understand someone coming back and saying, hey, uh, I'm not against everyone. You've chosen to be. Everyone is against me. So my <laughs> counter is to say, okay, I accept that. So that's a beautiful thing. But I would suggest that that is right out of the playbook. Of course, that's what they're going to co-opt is real issues. And I, and right. I kind of wrap up the, the hmm. rant here by pointing out like a tiny mistake you made with Gloria Steinem, which is really the whole mistake. And it's the whole mistake with the transgender guy, the Muslim transgender. I mean, they have all these kind of mixed kind of things where it just sends your head spinning and it's really just a psyop kind of thing. But it's not that Gloria Steinem was a figurehead. Gloria Steinem was a lifetime player. <laughs> she, was, she was recruited early Is. on yeah. to go to the social 
to, to go to the student movement things. And she mm -hmm. came back and her CIA op said, she's dynamite. She's a whiz kid. Steinamite. <laughs> <laughs> we, have an, we have a job to do here, buddy. Uh -huh. And she gets the job done. So it's not that she was a, a figurehead for feminism. That's really irrelevant. What's mm -hmm. important is how she played into this social engineering machine. And I would come back again and say, until we're, really, until we're willing to address that straight on, then mm -hmm. I don't think we can get there. And that's why yeah. I so like and respect David Icke. And even though he has a million crazy ideas that don't stand up to scrutiny, and even though sometimes he's weak on the science, as I pointed out to him in our interview, he is fundamentally putting his finger on the issue that there is an organized effort, a conspiracy, if you will, to, to, to mold you into thinking that what he calls your five cents mind, your biological robot in a meaningless universe meme, that that is who you are and that you are meaningless, you are helpless, you are powerless. And that is part of this agenda in terms of identifying people sexually, which is such a bizarre and absurd notion to begin with, because anyone with half a, a sensibility says, what business do I have? How is it even a concern? It's some kind of con crazy cult thing that's associated with religion that even gave us the notion that we have any business to even have an opinion on someone's sexuality. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> there's so there's so much. So let me just like try to let, let me just try to go on my own sort of rant here. Let's see if I can pull it off. Um so first of all to say that some of the best people examining those issues are trans people, right? So when you have people that are in the fray of the deepening of their sense of identity around gender and gender expression, a lot of times they're the ones going so deep into that, that they're able to experience a kind of, uh, a different kind of revelation about it. That's certainly true about sex work and me. It's, you know, this philosopher that I like, uh, Felix Guattari, who called it a line of flight. It's like you do it so much that suddenly you take off and you can see things from a different vantage point that nobody else can see. And then you can bring real questions. You can bring real questions. But why is this important in regards to evil? So as you said before, using my uh, the, the thing I said that Rudolf Steiner said, which is on the one hand absurd and on the other hand completely true. Um, when we do evil in our own lives, we through our own freedom and effort and, uh, and, and incarnations, we work that out, right? We take it on and we redeem it in ourselves through karma and process. There is evil located and lodged in so many different social issues, which relate to social engineering in one way or the other. We can see this in a very easy way. If we look at someone like Martin Heidegger, the philosopher who ended up being a Nazi, but we can see that there's value in some of the things that he says as a philosopher. We can see it in Nietzsche. We can see it in all these people, right? So when I look at philosophers like that, I need to look at, I, I can't just do this bullshit thing, which people do all the time, which I find completely objectionable, which is, well, you just take the good and you leave the bad, just move on with the good stuff, because that doesn't address the foundational thing that you bring up all the time. What I need to do is find out how the good and the bad are entangled and liberate that philosophy from itself. So it becomes redeemed because evil almost always, not always, but almost always wants to actually be redeemed and saved by us and by our fruitful action. So when I look at these social movements, whatever they are, and the ways that they are either created or entangled in social engineering, my job is not to be like, well, you know, there's good stuff that came out of it, so just ignore the bad, or it's all bad, so condemn it. My work is to go deep into that and transform it by seeing those connections and liberate it from itself. And that's what we do in the task of evil all the time in ourselves through our karma. But we also need to do it socially and in these issues. I think that's wonderful. And I think that you're talking about something very spiritual there in terms of your spiritual journey. 
and your personal spiritual journey and about transformation. But I am going to kind of persist on this other issue because I think it gets us back to the evil question in a larger sense, because I'm totally down with what you're saying about from a personal evil thing and a personal evil thing in a lot of ways is so evil, so easy because we all confront our personal evil all the time and we identify with it and we are struggling with it in a way that we usually have to come to grips with sooner or later. The collective evil, I think, is a little bit harder. And what I notice and what I'm calling out is a certain avoidance of wanting to look at that collective evil. And I'd return to my buddy David Icke again, because I think, I think what he's saying is quite profound. If there is an overall agenda aimed at consciousness to intentionally separate you from your connection to higher consciousness, and part of that agenda is to reinforce your connection to technology, to materialism, to biological robot in a meaningless universe, then I think we need to understand if that's real, if that's in play, and I think we need to take action accordingly, and we could talk about what that action is. Do you get why I'm persisting on that? Do you, do you think we've nailed that or no? Yeah, I'm a little confused because I think what I said sort of addresses what you're talking about. So 100% I agree with you. And I, by the way, agree with David Icke's assessment, um, at least in the terms that you framed it in, that there is a technocratic control project underway and it is linked to definitive evil not just hurt people hurting people or people being confused or whatever, but there is actually an agenda. Now, there's a deeper question as to whether or not that agenda is actually set by the spiritual world <laughs> um, or if it's set by individuals or individuals influenced by the spiritual realm in a specific way um, or acting it out. So I think there are all these questions that we have to sort through as well, but that seems very clear to me. I agree with you there. And that presses a question upon us of tactics and strategy. But I think what I'm talking about is actually part of it, which is um, we need to have a certain approach to evil when we see it, which is one knowing that it wants to be liberated from itself, that it wants to be redeemed. Um, and we can see that in our own anatomy and experience if we accept the principle of reincarnation, which I'm not going to go into whether or not we should. You've done a lot of shows on it. I think it's pretty definitive that, that, that that's the thing. But I think um, we, so we know from our own spiritual anatomy that that's happening. And we need to bring that intentionally to the way that we approach evil in the world, which is what matters is how I greet you evil. What matters is how I greet you because that's the only way. It's like a Chinese finger trap. The more I struggle in the wrong way, the, the tighter it gets. But I need to find the right way to let that it relax so I can remove myself so I can approach in the proper way. So after that, there still are some tactic. There still are some tactical problems. Like what the fuck do we do about the fact Without even going into 5G, what do we do about the fact that our media, including this that we're on right now, is carried by uh, microwaves that are divided like a flip book, you know, to carry certain amounts of information. And suddenly, lo and behold, people have a hard time paying attention to things. Things come to us in sound bites. Uh, things come in little blips and sort of bizarro, like, you know, two second things, it's because the actual medium of transfer of information is affecting how we receive and reflect on the world in general. So how do we deal with the fact that the actual media, like not the actual transfer of information is having a disruptive effect on our consciousness? Do we tear down cell phone towers? Do we take material action? Do we find the culprit and punish them? Do we create counter devices? Do we engage in occult technologies? Do we practice magic? Do we pray? Those questions all rise to the surface when we look around and we find ourselves in a pool of evil, in a pool of a problem. And so we have tactical questions ahead of us that aren't just 
um, well, I'll just be a good person, right? Now, you can do that and everything will be all right, sure. But the question is, do we want a thousand years of suffering before everything's all right? Or do we want like 20 years of like difficulty and then we get it right? You know, I mean, I think that that's a real question. And um, maybe that sounds materialistic, but I also don't like suffering. <laughs> so I'm just going to go with my own, you know, likes and desires there. And I don't think other people do either. And I think it's part of my spiritual responsibility to help people with that and not just leave the earth in my thinking and be like, well, everything's going to be okay. Who cares? You know? What are your thoughts on right action? Because I think this is something that we all wrestle with and that is the being versus doing question and is working on myself working to not be triggered working to find the warmth and humanity as you talked about in the beginning is that enough does god need our help the gods need our help but god does not so um the gods you know, if you're serious about that you would have to break that down. Well, you know, we still have 20 minutes um, or, or more, maybe a half hour before I have to go. So let me just, let me just lay it on you. Yes, y yeah. Um, I wouldn't call it a hierarchy of consciousness. I would call it a hierarchy of consciousness or a hierarchy of conscious, of evolving states of consciousness that appear as entities um, from the vantage point that we're at when actually it's just more sort of topo top topological. But um, yeah. So what kind of it, topology? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> well, let me, let, me, let me get back to the original statement, which is the gods need our help, but God does not. I mean, God is, first of all, God is so far beyond what most of us understand that I can't, I'm not going to even, it's hard for me to apprehend that from my standpoint and from my vantage point. Um, but okay, if you want to say some sort of totality or whatever, um, a, a, the, the totality of the consciousness state. But as far as the other beings go, we even see this weird turning point in mythology, you know, with, with, with Theseus and the Minotaur and all this kind of stuff where the gods are suddenly asking for humans to help them complete their tasks. And before that, you see the gods sort of, you know, I, I'm not using this as a reality claim, I'm just using it as a metaphor, where you see the gods sort of... Um, positioning people as pawns and moving them around and all that kind of stuff. And then suddenly as consciousness begins to change and evolve, the gods are like, Hey, could you help me with this thing? You know? And so <laughs> we see in our, in our own lives as the sort of uh, the way that consciousness evolves to reflect a certain kind of freedom, a certain kind of free will, a certain kind of uh, difference from the kind of deterministic, ways that we might have lived in before, um, then we have different duties and different responsibilities. And with those come different dangers. And so, yes, there are, uh, I'll just state outright, there are angelic beings, or archangels that want us to align with them for this battle against evil. Um, and from their vantage point, the battle against evil looks very different than from ours. Um, but they can't do it on their own because we have free will, because we're not biological robots. That invites in the possibility, well, we talked about this the last time I was on the show, but that invites in the possibility of us doing evil. So we actually have to uh, get right with them. And that includes a lot of different things. That includes study, contemplation, prayer. It also includes the very basic guiding principles for us, which are freedom and compassion. I mean, that's really it. Like if you can just drill down, but <laughs> that sounds easy, but it's not easy. And that sounds simple, but it's not simple. <laughs> I appreciate you laying all that out and just being so direct about it. I, I'm not sure that I agree. And I really want to get out there an alternative perspective. I mean, I may agree. You know, a lot of people are, are saying what you're saying and they make a good case for it. And there's certainly a lot of... Uh, human experience that would back up what you're saying in terms of, I love angel stories. I love angel accounts. I'm not inclined to dismiss them because they have a lot of connection, but here is kind of the, the kind of yogic non-dual perspective, however it gets cast, but I think is important. And I'm particularly drawn to Western interpretations of that non-dual perspective. 
and one is kind of an Eastern and the guy's a, a creep. And uh, this is back to your, we're, we're comp, all these complicated people, but the <laughs> TM guy, Maharashi Mahesh Yogi, you know, hmm. who is a creep and is a, a cult kind of founder. But at the same time, I've talked to enough of his people that he had some spiritual energy, some pure spiritual power and some spiritual insights that we shouldn't ignore. And I love the way that you talk about, uh, you know, liberating the truths from the falsehoods in a way that kind of empowers us to transform. Anyways, long way around the barn of saying, it's all in the middle is the essence of that. If you want to play that game with demons and angels, have at it. But you are ultimately trying to tr transcend all of that. So if your transcendence of that is to engage, well, that may be good or it may not be good. But what some of those folks are advising us, and it seems to make sense to me, is that you don't need to engage because your ultimate goal is to transcend that as well and get down to the core essence of your connection to that higher consciousness without the need for the intermediary realm. And you know what's consistent? what I've heard about that is that most of this evil we're talking about is not very powerful in the bigger scheme of things. And we often engage in empowering it by engaging with it. And that can go in a million different directions that we don't have time to go. It's going to be have to talk really fast because you only have 20 minutes left, but there Wait, it is. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, first of all, that's to me an op. Um, so I want to address that as an op in and of itself. Why? Because the idea of transcendence um, is, this, this is what people who do like Advaita Vedanta, like, oh, all is energy, it's all well, everything's perfect, all that. That's true, but you can't, I think that that's true on a certain level. But pretending that you're accessing that when there are people suffering and those people are a part of you and you have a deep connection to them through consciousness and through what it means to be human is a dereliction of duty to yourself, to heaven, um, whatever you want to call it, to the cosmos. And I think that, you know, this idea of transcendence... Hold on, though. People are going yeah. to get tired of the same old skeptical stories. But And I think I even shared this with you on the last <laughs> one we did. But you got the, yeah. the Ama example that I always go to, right? Mm, so mm. Ama, the hugging saint, <laughs> fully engaged in life, working with people tirelessly. She's an old lady. I don't know how she does it 18 hours a day of mm. hugging people, the ultimate gift of connection or digging trenches with the untouchables in India. What a contradiction that is that we have this mm. gift of a jewel of spirituality of India and they created this system where they have untouchables. It's another way that evil manifests itself. So you have a person that is totally engaged in the act of loving and giving and engagement and warmth mm -hmm. and humanity. But when pressed for why she does that, when the whole thing is supposed to be transcended, she says, world, what world? She is mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. even in this world on her spiritual level, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. she realizes that the, the paradox that in her actions, she can be totally engaged. She can be the guy who will jump in front of the bullet to save someone else who will save Annika Lucas from ritual sexual abuse and murder and will ultimately die because of it. So there's many acts, great and small of kindness from people who are committed to transcendence. Yeah. So, okay, you're right. Like I'm not, I'm not typifying like the entire idea of I live uh, at least partially in the spiritual realm because I've transcended. I'm talking about the idea of transcendence, like, um, you know, like the, the idea of leaving the kind of responsibility of materiality behind. Here's the reason. And this goes back to the reality claim. The being that is causing the trouble right now, <laughs> that is the, you know, lots of people like to use this term archon. I'm not a fan of it, but for people to understand the archon or whatever. The being that's causing all the trouble right now is a being whose anatomy is composed of materialism. When we 
decide to transcend this plane, we're actually leaving that being behind. So we might be doing all the kinds of work that we're supposed to be doing for each other and all that, but the spiritual realm is being neglected because that being out of its own essence has no choice but to draw us all towards materialistic uh, existence. And so we think we're being so great because we, with all due respect to Amma, who seems pretty great, we think we're doing so great because we are transcending and, and hugging people and saying, well, what world is there and all that kind of stuff. But as long as we, even if we just did all that and every other human being was perfect, we're leaving the spiritual beings behind and we have a responsibility to them as well. Now, I don't think that's all that's happening there, but I just want to bring that up as one point that evil waits to be redeemed by us through love. And when we don't do that, because we just live in the spiritual realm, we're actually giving up on suffering that needs to be transformed. Your awesomeness continues to shine, Connor. <laughs> What's going on with Against Everyone? And you said the book's next year. What other projects are you working on there in Ireland? And what's going uh, on? I'm, I'm trying to like take in as much of Ireland as possible. I'd like to know the land and the, the, the spiritual beings here better. I'd like to understand um, a lot, you know. So I'm trying to learn the language, learn music, all that kind of stuff. Like just take it all in. Um, Give, you us know, a little, my, give us a little uh, uh, bit of the language. Oh, God, I don't know. No, not yet. <laughs> no, I'm terrible at it. Um, the, the Irish language is uh, very complicated. Um, well, all languages are complicated for me because I'm a total dummy about them, but uh, except English. So, um, so I'm not the, <laughs> don't, have, don't ask me to do that. That's the most challenging skeptical question so far in this episode. Um, but, uh, yeah. And against everyone, it just continues to, it, it continues to grow. I mean, I think not that anybody's asking this, but I think it, like you as an exemplar for me, um, and some other podcasters, but there aren't a lot of them who just decide, you know, I want to have this conversation because it's important for me to have this conversation, but it's also important for this conversation to radiate and to go out there. And um, if you don't have a podcast yourself, you know, the idea behind my show is that, and I think yours too, in a way, is like, maybe these conversations will happen in people's lives if I just display the ones that I'm having, you know, because that's really important because these questions are important. So I'm just going to keep following that, you know. Right on to that. Against everyone with Connor Habib, wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> Connor, thanks again. That's awesome. Never disappoint, my friend. You never disappoint. So <laughs> thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks, Alex. I love talking with you. Thanks again to Connor Habib for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd have to tee up from this interview has to do with what I think is his excellent point about just take the good and leave the bad. I, I think he's really on to something about it's more complicated than that. And I think we all have misgivings about the bad that we have to swallow with what we're told is good. So what do you think about that? Let me know. Pop on over to the Skeptico Forum, drop a note, or send me an email, or however else you would like to connect please do so. It's so wonderful to find out who's out there and to find out what's going on in this little community that we have. So I have some interesting stuff coming up on Skeptico. Please stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now. <laughs>